Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Wandering Road Podcast. I'm your host Chris, alongside my co-host Dean, and for today's show, we're going to be delving into a little bit of true crime. Our topic today is going to be the Eight Immortal Murders, or also known as the Chinese Pork Bun Murders. But joining us for today's show is Susie from the Susie Ideally YouTube channel. How are you doing today, Susie? I'm good. I'm a bit nervous, but thanks for having me today. No need to be nervous. It'll, it's Just think of it as just you're just hanging out with a group of friends, having drinks, and just talking about true crime and some weird, decrepit shit that we're going to get into with this story. Yeah, But I Dean, how are you doing ready. today, buddy? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> we all do, which is great. Yes, listeners, yeah. we're all kind of boozed up here but dean <laughs> how three, are you doing buddy <laughs> all, all three of our listeners to take off the pressure pressure from Susie. <laughs> hi mom i keep making that same joke yeah i'm good man how about you i'm doing all right i'm kind of excited for this one because i did not know this was a thing until i started uh messaging back and forth with Susie about potential topics specifically with uh true crime in asia i didn't know there was like a shit ton of them that you know you could look through and go through and this one you look at it and you just hear the title it's like pork bun murders it's like what the hell does pork bun have to do with murders and then when you look into it (laughs) it's one of those cases where it's like the more you read it it starts off like okay okay and then when you get to the end it's like holy shit like, yeah what like this is disgusting it's it's gruesome and it, it's just one of those things I'm, I'm just excited to both of your thoughts on this one but Susie why don't you uh, introduce yourself to the audience a little bit why don't you tell us a little bit about your YouTube channel and your interest in true crime and that you might be potentially starting your own podcast wow um so thanks for that introduction and I do have a YouTube channel. I mean, it's I've had it since like 2010. Oh, I always post it very casually. And it's not a true crime channel. It's just kind of like a, it started out as when, like a lifestyle. Uh, whenever I did anything interesting, I would vlog it and upload it. But that was like only once a year because my life is not that exciting. Uh, but fun fact is... Uh, but I've always wanted to be a YouTuber. I'm very fascinated by the whole influencer content creation route. But earlier last year, I actually had a baby. So I'm a new mom. And I was... Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Congrats. I have a seven-month-old now. Thank you. And so I started posting kind of my experience, like shorts, as, as like a new mom of my baby. And people, I guess, finally, like people discovered my channel that way. And it actually grew because I was on maternity leave I was posting pretty consistently and I actually made a YouTube partner last year it's still a very small channel but yeah that was like a really big milestone in my YouTube career can I ask you a question you have a seven month old how are you and (laughs) and there they are I was just gonna say how are you functioning right now how are you awakened and uh, able to think and process. Cause I remember when I had my daughter, she's three now. Uh, my wife and oh. I were like zombies for a while. So props to you for looking presentable and, <laughs> and being able to put two sentences together. Thank you for saying I look presentable. I tried really hard today. Uh, but I think that it's just important to have a system and obviously have a good and supportive partner. We both take turns sleeping. So our baby right now, he yeah. gets up about twice. And then I would take the first feeding and then he takes the second. So we each get one long stretch of sleep and we kind of have nice. it figured out by now. Yeah. Pay attention, Chris. This is exactly how it works. <laughs> yes. Oh, dude, I'm the light sleeper. So me and my wife already agreed that if the child, future baby wakes up whenever we have that baby, 
it'll probably beat me waking up. <laughs> so you know that that's actually what happened to me. I, I'm the same way. And our for my wife and I, our deal in the beginning was like, okay, I'll get our daughter at night because I had more flexible hours at work. Yeah, I think like trade off. There's no sense that you are both suffering at the same time. I think that is the <laughs> how we do it. Like yeah. we sh- like we have we allocate like you do you handle it this time and then let me relax and then you know so you get you each get your rest exactly and then make sure occasionally you pepper in there some um really crass jokes about how you know what are you doing you're you're supposed to be in the kitchen why aren't you holding the baby and and making dinner and then you get slaps from your wife and you start laughing and then it's all fun and games until you know she beats you up no, yeah, he he makes jokes like he's just like you're the mom, you should do it. But he, it's like a joke, but I know he really means it. No, he doesn't mean it. No, <laughs> we don't mean it when we say that. It's all a joke. Um, no, that's great though that uh, that you have time to do this sort of thing in the YouTube channel. Your YouTube channel is kind of like starting to take off. That's really exciting. Yeah, as just be consistent, and plus, uh, YouTube is really pushing shorts. And it's just so much easier to make than a long form channel. And as long as it's something that people resonate with. So I I had two semi viral videos. (laughs) It each hit over a million views, Uh, but they're shorts. So uh, so that was really what helped uh, brought my channel to partner level. And I, I had a goal to make partner at the end of the last year and I was able to do it. So it was really it was just really cool and i'm trying to see and now i'm trying to enter the podcast space obviously <laughs> so yeah i'm happy to be here today thank you for having me oh absolutely we're 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 happy to have you to discuss this topic today because you were the one that actually suggested it yeah um so i've always been a fan of true crime which is weird because you know females tend to i always found that females are most fascinated with true crime as compared to all my male friends. My husband hates it. So I don't really have anybody to talk to talk to talk to about <laughs> this. So I'm glad I found you guys. Uh yeah, so I watch like pretty big uh YouTubers like uh Mr. Ballin, Bailey Sarian, and then another Korean YouTuber called Grazy TV. And uh, so yeah, I've heard about this case growing up. Like it was a, it's a pretty famous case in Hong Kong and China, and I'm like I'm Chinese, so I've I've heard of it, but I never really dug into it until like to prepare for this podcast. And it's exactly what you imagine. I find that crimes like uh, committed by Asians, it's always a little really like out. It's really bizarre. They take it to the next level as compared to what you hear about from like American crimes and American serial killers, I feel like. And this case really embodies that. I'm so glad you brought that up because we were talking offline before we started a little bit and um, you kind of sparked my memory again about that. So like there is this really incredible perspective about Asian crimes that happen in Asian countries. And sometimes like you just, like you said, they're just so out there. They're just like so intense or it's like how in the world, and we're going to talk about this today, but like how in the world can someone go systematically like slit the throats of a family or something like that. And that's just something you don't really hear about happening in America. Like you hear like terrible things like gun violence, like mass death that way, but it's much less personal with guns and stuff, it's like you're from a distance and you're taking someone's life. You're not really up close and personal, but like some of these stories coming out of Asia, like I remember there was this one and I'm probably going to get the details drastically wrong, but I think there was this Japanese girl or I think it was, I think it was actually a boy, maybe something about um, like he felt dishonored by being bullied at school or, or something like that. And he went in at home and he killed his grandparents because of that feeling of dishonor. Um, which is very, you know, kind of like counter to what you would ex- probably expect in America. Like if, if someone like felt slighted in America, they would go after the person slighting them or their family. But in this case, it was like, oh, I, I don't have, like, I just feel inadequate. I have to take myself out of the equation and have to take my family out as well, because they're going to be shamed. I don't want to feel them 
uh, you know, see them be shamed or whatever. So it's just like, I guess it's just kind of like a different cultural perspective. Just a quick story. When I was, I went to Japan for the first time, I think four or five months ago. And it was, it was a beautiful, amazing trip. Like I love Japan, nothing but the sweetest, nicest people I've ever met in my life. But when I was going over there on the plane, I'm like, hmm, maybe I'll be responsible since I'm traveling with my family. Let's, let's see what, what's in the news over there. And like one of the first news channels or the news um, articles that I was looking into was some, some uh, monk who owned a monastery or not monastery, but like a, I don't know what you would call it, like a little temple or something in Tokyo. He was targeted by two guys, I guess, who wanted his land. And they set up this like really elaborate situation where they put a bunch of gasoline open in these burn chambers for bodies or whatever, like underneath the ground, underneath the temple. And they opened up all the plugs from the containers. And they knew that this guy who would go down there to like do whatever they do down there in the, um, the chamber, he ended up asphyxiating and dying because he didn't know that all those fumes were down there. Turned out it was like this big murder case about these two guys who wanted to, who were trying to get this monk to like seed the land to them. And they ended up killing him to try to get those rights somehow. But it's just like, I was on my way to Japan hearing that story. I'm like, what the fuck is, what is happening in Japan? <laughs> and then there was another story that was right after that about how there were like bears attacking random people throughout cities in Japan. I'm like, what the fuck is happening? It is so strange. Anyway, I go off on a tangent there, but yeah, like just, just like we were saying, Japan, or I mean, um, um, Asian countries tend to have like really intense stories about death and stuff like that. Yeah, I think it's just that I feel like Asians in general, they really care about their image and their face. And they're usually more like you would think more submissive. We have a more submissive. That's how we are perceived. And then but then when we snap, then we do crazy shit. And that's why that's how you get these like crazy murders of like killing a whole family and cannibalism and all these uh, crazy things. And I kind of have a theory for that. And the reason I think that is, is because when you look at Asia as a whole, and I'll include like India in there as well, it's a very structured culture that has not changed for over like 5,000 years. And what you don't really do is deviate from what's expected and deviate from the norm. And, you know, we're all human beings. Like, you can only take so much, and then you get to your breaking point. And I think that's why in certain places, like the case we're about to talk about today, is, like, why it's so gruesome. It's because of that. It's like, okay, my backlash is going to be so massive and so severe that everyone has to feel it. Yeah, it's not like just, (laughs) yeah, it's it's like the ultimate fuck you moment to like this entire society. Yeah, because we tend to bottle things up, but not this guy that we're about to talk about. He has, he killed before, but then he, and he got triggered again and killed even (laughs) worse. So I think it's a good opportunity to talk about like, let's, let's, I guess maybe let's focus for a second about the location this happened. And so if you're not familiar with um, the geography of China and stuff like that, Macau is in the Southeast portion of China. It's actually a stone's throw away from Hong Kong, but it's considered, I don't know if it's, it's like the uh, gambling capital of the world per se, but I think one of the metrics I read was the total annual revenue in Macau is like seven or eight times larger than Las Vegas in terms of gambling. So there's a ton of gambling. There's a ton of money in Macau. I think that's where they do like the Formula One races. So there's just like, it's kind of like Singapore light in my mind, like crazy rich Asian Asian level. But like when I think of a place like this, there's just so much money focused on this one area. And it's not just money. There is chance and opportunity to, to gain and become rich from that big pile of money that exists there, which isn't the same from across the, like across the globe. Like you can't just go like some places just don't have gambling. Like they don't just have a lot of avenues to get really rich, really fast. But Macau is one of those places where it's kind of like, like say the stock market where you can go like people nowadays, there's an obsession with like zero days to expiration trading, like all kinds of this crazy gambling stuff where you can just throw all your money in one go and you can really strike it rich. Like you could literally make enough money in a second to retire. 
but more likely than not, you're going to lose everything. So I like to think about it from that psychological perspective with this family and everything that happened with the Eight Immortals restaurant. It's like you have the mom and the dad who are addicted to gambling. And we'll, we'll go into more detail about this, but just to set up the situation, you have a mom and a dad who own the shop, the restaurant, they have a family, but they're also very um, admired or like just kind of down into that, into the weeds of that gambling that's going on in Macau. And clearly what like they're driven by becoming wealthy. They don't want to do what they're doing anymore for the rest of their lives. They want to have that nest egg or that, that ability to break free financially, kind of like you want to do what like, people want to do with uh, YouTube <laughs> or being a podcaster or, or podcasting. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so totally understand but you know when you get that kind of money and you you feel this is a situation where like we've all been there like i've been there like i i dabble in the stock market there have been, there have been times where like i had like loss after loss after loss and i'm like god like why you kind of you you know that there's nothing higher above you that is like slighting you but you also kind of have that thing in the back of your mind you're like why is this happening to me no just for and you I, there is just there for is. Me. yeah just for i you. just he's like ah, he's just, fuck you, you <laughs> fuck you dean <laughs> so i think it's the same way psychologically probably even worse though for this family who who they have a good like they have a decent life they have their own business but they're not breaking free anytime soon and they really want to break free so where all where the story really all starts and we'll like i said we'll go back a little bit and set it up a little bit more but where it all starts is this infatuation with making a lot of money quickly and you have the person who killed them the people who were the victims, they're all centered around this concept of trying to get rich quickly. And what do you do when you mix money with this feeling of feeling inadequate, like you were saying, Susie, and then also like feeling like you're being slighted or, um, or the universe isn't giving you, paying you your dues, even though you've been trying so hard, then you really start to get this like carnal hatred that builds up between people. I don't know, Susie or Chris, do you want to like talk a little bit about the background leading into this, this whole situation, like the family and the restaurant and stuff? Yeah, so I'll 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 kick us off. I, I apologize if I butcher his name. It's Huang Ji Heng or Hong. It's pretty close. Uh, Huang Ji Hong. Huang. Huang, Huang Ji Hong. Okay. Sorry, I'm gonna ask Dean, are you partially Chinese? <laughs> Do I look? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry. I um I'm just kidding. I yeah, I'm not. I'm full uh white boy. Uh, okay. But I did take I did take Mandarin in college, so that's why I do have a little bit of an understanding of of pronunciation. Got it. Cool. All right. Yeah, I, I'm a historian, so I just try to be as close to the pronunciation as possible. <laughs> and he corrects me whenever I'm whenever I'm wrong, so I'm appreciative of that. So don't feel bad to correct me. So Huang, our buddy Huang here, he was originally from mainland China. And he immigrated to Hong Kong in the 70s. So before he ended up murdering all of these people, this entire family, 10 of them, he was a gambler himself. So when he's in Hong Kong, he gets into gambling. He gets into a dispute with a guy. He ends up killing him. And then after he kills him in Hong Kong, he flees to Guangzhou, which is in southern China, and he lives in Guangzhou for a few years. He, I guess he found a place to live, and he got close with the landlord's daughter, and the family didn't like him very much. They're like, this dude is weird. Like, he's into gambling. He's really creepy. With good reason. Yeah, yeah we don't... <laughs> There's something off about him, but the daughter was like, Screw you guys. I like him. So they elope and then they end up leaving uh, mainland China to go to Macau. And before he does that, this is what this psychopath does to make sure he is not connected to that murder in Hong Kong at all. He burned off his own finger, like fingerprints, and he cut off the tip of his index fingers to make sure he couldn't be tied to any type of nefarious activity or murders in Hong Kong. So then he goes to Macau, and that's when he meets his victims, Zheng Lin and his wife, who were also heavy gamblers. 
and they were the owners of the Eight Immortals restaurant. Hence why we get the name The Eight Immortals Murder. But I'll kick it over to you, Susie. You want to pick it up from there? Yeah. So I so Eight Immortal Murders, if anyone is curious in Chinese, it's Batsin Fandim. So literally translates to Eight Immortal Murders. And there's very little um little known about Huang's childhood. Uh, so as I was doing research, many places, uh, many sources said there's nothing really about his childhood, just that, you know, he was caught up in a lot of illegal activities. Um, so when he moved to Macau, he got caught up in the gambling scene and he met Jang Lin and his wife, who are heavy gamblers. They actually ran a very successful restaurant. Uh, they started off as a food stall in the 60s and then due to the success they turned into a restaurant and it was so successful they had their whole family which is a total of 10 people helping to run and operate the restaurant but unfortunately even though it was a very successful restaurant they couldn't escape their gambling problems and they were also not really good gamblers and would constantly and regularly lose money and that was when they met Huang they came across each other and they started actually befriending each other. They would hang out. They would gamble together. Uh, and then one day they got involved in high stakes betting. And the Zhang family, the Zhang couple, they lost about $20,000 to Huang. And that's a lot of money. And keep in mind, this was the 80s. And if I lost $20,000 now, I'm going to, you know... <laughs> I'm going to poop my pants. So imagine losing that <laughs> in the 80s. And obviously, they couldn't pay it back. So they reached an agreement. Huang said that, all right, if you cannot pay it back within one year, you got to give up your restaurant. And honestly, I find that to be very reasonable for a, like, he's a murderer. So I found that really reasonable. I'm like, okay, yeah. <laughs> Like when you when you lose your gambling debts, you have to pay it. And so they came to that agreement. And then one year passed. And then in the during the, that year, they were they didn't stop gambling. They kept on gambling. And then in total, the Zhang family lost seventy five thousand dollars in gambling debts to Huang. And and that's where uh, this was now in nineteen eighty six. And I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to pass it off to Dean, if you want to pick it up from there, what happened after that year. Popcorn, Dean. Yeah, I'm popcorn. You guys remember that? Oh, my yes. God. <laughs> um, anyway, so, yeah, so essentially, after that, it, things started, get, start, started to get really heated, right? So, Jung Lin and his wife, they essentially didn't want to pay him back. They, they, I don't know. I can't even imagine what would be going through their minds right now. Like you said, like, you know, they must know that, I mean, they're, they're not, I guess they're not the best people in the world because like, if they're going to shirk on a bet like that and they made a promise and they continue to, if they really did continue to lose money to this guy, it's kind of shitty. I mean, I'm not saying they deserve to die, but like at the same time, it's kind of like they were kind of asking for trouble in a way, especially since they didn't really know who this guy was, I, even if you like, let's say hypothetically, they knew him for even like two years, which is probably around the time that they really got to know him. That's not a lot of time to know somebody, especially if they came from another part of the country that you didn't really have any connections to or really know anything about. So this guy, Huang, who ended up killing uh, these people, he just got pissed off. He's like, you know, you owe me money. You promised me to get, you know, to hand over the uh, the restaurant if you couldn't pay it back. I'm here to collect my dues. And of course they didn't want to pay him back. They said, you know, of course, we're not going to do that. So at that point, I imagine Huang would just get really upset. He he probably has financial responsibilities himself. Maybe he has some gambling owes to other people, but he is not quite rich just like they are, but he has an opportunity to take a step up and they're blocking him from doing that. So he feels slighted and he wants to take action. So he ends up grabbing a bottle, right? And smashing the bottle against a table. And he starts to threaten the family, like, you know, give everything to me, like blah, blah, blah. And he grabs, I think it was the youngest or not the youngest, but uh, one of the, was His it the son. daughter? 
Oh, he his grabbed son. Sorry. the son, okay. the only son first. He grabbed the only son first. Okay. Yeah. Started to threaten the family. I'm like, Hey, you better give me what I, what I'm due or I'm going to start um, cutting your son. From that point on, there was a lot of panic in the room, I imagine, and people really on edge. But I think it was the daughter uh, tried to make a break for it, right? Wasn't the daughter tried to yeah. run away? Yep. Yeah. And uh, Huang just instinctively let go of the sun and grabbed this this girl. And I imagine like he was just gone at that point. He was just like tunnel vision. He ends up like cutting her throat, stabbing her, or whatever, like slicing into her. And she's not quite dead yet, apparently according to some accounts, she falls to the ground and she's bleeding out. And then he realized, I imagine this is the point where Huang realizes like, I'm done like this. I can't do this again. I killed somebody in Hong Kong. I got away from that. The only chance I have now is to get rid of all of the evidence. And the worst part of the story, you know, trigger warning for everybody. He decides that the only way in that moment to, to fix, potentially fix his solution or his problem, the solution is to kill systematically the entire family. So he starts, you know, he tells the family to start tying each other up and um, gets them all bound and gagged, presumably. And then he systematically goes through and starts to kill every single one of them. And and I just want to emphasize again, like this is like we're not here to to glorify this or like talk about this moment as like oh edgy and exciting. This is really shitty, terrible stuff, and it's just a part of the story that has to be told. But you know, the kids were young, and which is I you know I'm sure you, Susie, like you know you're a mother, I'm a father. Like I fucking hate talking about this stuff now. Like if I when I was younger and I didn't have any kids, I could talk about this stuff all day and feel nothing, <laughs> or not you know like not feel like I would feel like bad, but I wouldn't feel like close to home. But now it's like, I can't talk about this. That is because... true. Ever since I became a mom, like I just get scared hearing more scared hearing about these things. Like there's so much bad people out there. Got to protect yeah. your, yeah. Now you I, I do understand. Like to... Now yeah. you understand your parents. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He's and, never and I, leaving. I, I... <laughs> <laughs> He's never leaving the home. <laughs> Hook and reel. Um, yeah. So, I mean, if you're out there and you're, if you don't have any kids, like I, I always kind of like snicker a little bit when I hear someone say, Oh, I fucking hate kids. And it's like, yeah, well, have you ever like, have you ever taken care of them? Have you ever been around them when they're young and like seen how they need people and, and like realizing you were once that young and like all of those things that go along with being presented. And that's, that's why like, to me, when I hear stories like this, it's particularly disturbing because that means this guy was completely disassociated from the idea of innocence of a child. And wh whenever you have somebody like that, I feel like that is like, you can't always know a person's like that before you get to know them. Really. It's always after the fact, but like, if you, if you were to know that a person was like that, you would probably want to stay far away from them because anybody who doesn't have like a closeness or, or a reflection or affinity for children who are not theirs then that's kind of like a little bit in my mind, a red flag. So I guess that's the type of person this guy was. He went around and he ended up killing um, even all the way down to the youngest son, who was, I think, only seven. But the other kids were nine and 10 and 12. And it's like, God, man, like that's yeah. just you, no kid should ever have to go through anything close like that. And especially the parents who probably I don't even know who died first, but like that's even worse to have, you know, presumably have the parents be around for that. If it was me. I would break my arms, like trying to get out of like, I, you know, I would probably kill myself trying to get out like a wild animal. So I can't imagine they, they would probably go through the same thing. But so let's, let's kind of like get away from that part of the, the terrible part of the story and move on to the next part, which is, hey, you know, Dean, he, real he, quick, I wanted yeah, to man. touch on his mentality for a second, which you were kind of alluding to in general. Okay. So before he actually commits the murders and i just you know it's impossible for us to know exactly what he was thinking clearly he's killed people before like we know he killed at least one person we don't know if he actually killed other people prior to this so my whole thing is when he breaks the bottle and he like threatens the family I can't help but wonder like is this just a ploy to just get them to hand over the paperwork and everything kind of just went wrong from there. Like his whole plan just backfired. Yeah. Because I, yeah. I always wonder if his intention was to go. It's like, you know what? 
they're not paying me my money. They said they'd give me the paperwork for the restaurant. I'm going to go and kill all of them. Or do y'all think it was one of those cases where like, oh shit, this kind of went wrong and that's not what it was like I intended. I feel like he did not go in with the intention of killing them. He would, he just wanted his money back because they were arguing for a while and he was asked, he was willing to negotiate with them. He was like, just give me 30,000 pakata. I believe that's the currency. And they won't give it. And then he was even willing to come down to, all right, just give me 20,000 and they won't do it, which I think is like, why at that point? Like you have to have that as a small business owner lying around. Why are you like, why are you refusing to pay, to pay like, like compromise there? So like, I don't really feel as bad for the parents. <laughs> I only feel bad for the kids that were involved, like hit their family. Um, so like if you like you put yourself in that situation, then you kind of have it coming for you. Of course, nobody deserves to to like die in that manner. But that's what happens when you get yourself involved in bad situations like that. It just so happens that, that he came at a time when their whole family was there. And that was the tragic part. I don't know if you guys have seen this movie, but it's like from 1994. It's a Chinese movie called To Live. And oh. essentially. Have you seen it, Dean? I so read the book. It, it's a great book. It's 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 a really good book, and it's a really good movie. So it takes place. I think it like starts in 1940, so it's like during World War II, and then it goes through like the Mao era with the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. So the whole premise of the story is that this guy, he is a gambler, and he just goes to the gambling den all the time. And eventually, at a certain point, he loses everything. But then at like the end of the movie, I don't I can't remember if the book was the same thing, Dean, but he kind of like gets his shit together and everything is just happy, hunky dory. He like tries to be a soldier and then everything turns out well. I, I just couldn't help but think about that movie of you know, this family man that's like running a business. And then due to his gambling, similar to the movie, he just ends up losing everything. Unfortunately, he lost more than just everything. He lost his family. He lost his life. Dude, like even his like parents were killed. Like it, it just went out of control. But Susie, if you have not seen that movie, it's called To Live. And it came out in 94. It's actually really good. There's actually, there's a, obviously a, movie made about this specific case i think it was from 93 oh. or 94 also and it's oh, called okay. the untold story um i actually Susie, i don't know if you will find this funny or not but um so my so my wife i've said this on the podcast before my wife is actually like her family is from vietnam but she came over here when she was um i think three years old so she's like completely americanized like she doesn't like her parents still have a heavy accent and stuff but she but she still has a very close tie to her culture. And like, she gives me shit all the time for not being more uh, tied into or exposed to Asian culture, which I'm totally receptive to, but it's just kind of like, it's funny, like one little anecdote that I'll share. We were talking about, so you, we were just talking about movies and stuff like that. And like, like it was kind of funny how to live in my mind is a really well-known part of like the Asian diaspora in terms of like a really famous movie and a really great book and stuff. And like Susie, you never heard of it, which is totally fine. But it reminded me about this time where like this actually just happened like two years ago, or maybe it was like a year and a half ago. I knew of the Joy Luck Club. Like I knew about the story. But when I told my wife like last year, I'm like, I've never seen the Joy Luck Club. She lost her shit. She's like, how have you never seen the Joy Luck Club? It is such a huge staple of like culture not just Asian culture, but like, you know, like it was American cinema. Um, so she made me watch it and it was a great movie. But until I watched that, that movie, I actually thought the Joy Luck Club was about a group of older Asian people who were in America who became really rich because they pulled their money together and like put it in the stock market or something. I don't know why I thought that, but that is completely opposite of what the actual story is about. But anyway, that's, yeah, sorry to go off on a tangent. I just wanted to share that little nugget of randomness i don't actually Do you know guys... anything about the joy luck club so don't feel bad what? yes no i know way. a lot about asian true crime but not no that's totally <laughs> cool I, it's it, once again like you know it's a it's a really good movie and um it's one of those movies where it really showcases like 
the challenges of, of older Asians coming over to America, but also it highlights the darkness that can like stick around. Like just, just like the guy who traveled from Hong Kong to be the killer of this family, like he had a dark past as well. In that movie, it's kind of similar. You know, they come over and they do flashbacks throughout the movie about like the youth of, of these these women who come over from China. And like some of them had really dark experiences, like they were beaten or they were abused or neglected, or maybe like I think one of them like killed a child, like their own child or something like that, because they hate she hated the husband who uh ignored her and he was a womanizer and she ended up like in anger drowning their child or something like that and um yeah just just this concept like we were talking about earlier there's like a lot of darkness that can come out of these stories from asian culture that is like you know it's it's really it's one of the things where it's like you don't think about it until it happens but then you like chris you said you reflect on the culture and you're like oh i can kind of see how that comes about but I guess we'll we'll jump back into the story. And like, I don't know if you, Susie or Chris, if you want to keep us going along here, but the next part is essentially, let's pick it up from where uh, he tries to clean up his mess. The Huang guy, he, he, you know, he tries to clean up the mess of, of this murder, the, you know, the terrible murder he did of this entire family. And I imagine it must be a huge fucking mess. I'll, I'll kick it over to our guests. I'm sure our listeners are tired of hearing both of our voices yeah. every oh. episode. <laughs> right. So... This happened, this all happened on, okay, this was August 4th, 1985, so that's a date. So this all happened. He visited the restaurant as they were closing and cleaning up for the next day. Um, so this was, so the restaurant was closed, so he had, he spent the whole night cleaning up his mess, you know, using uh, like a knife, probably a butcher knife, hacking off their body parts and disposing of it. And the weirdest part of this story is that like afterwards he cleaned it up put it all in bags dispose of it probably at the nearby beach he went to their home and slept there because they lived very close by and i'm just like wow like this guy is like not really right in the head because you kill the family and then you go to their house and sleep there uh so it's kind of like adding insult to injury so he went to their home. He took all the money that they can find. He found the documents like of the restaurant to the restaurant. So he got what he wanted, which was basically his money back and ownership of his restaurant. It was the next morning that the delivery driver who normally delivers the food for the restaurant, he saw a sign outside that said that the restaurant will be closed for the next three days. I was all switched to him and rang and rang some bells because he didn't hear about this and he delivers food to the restaurant every morning. So like, why wouldn't the Zhang family tell him about it? And he actually took the liberty to knock on the door of their family, of their home. And then that was when Huang answered the door and said that the family had to make an emergency trip to mainland China. And then I guess at that point, it wasn't so weird yet because everybody knew that he was friends with them. He was associated with the Zhang family. So he just let it go. I guess for the next three days, he just laid low while disposing, cleaning up the mess. And then the weird, the other weird part is three days later, he opened the restaurant and ran it like normal. It's like, like as if there was no going to be no one's going to suspect a thing they wouldn't notice that a whole family is missing and he's just going to continue to operate the restaurant so what's insane it was like four days later a swimmer on the beach he found eight pieces of human limbs including four right hands and they suspected that it, like it was smugglers involved with like sharks or or something like that they thought it was like, you know, people like trying to smuggle shit over or somebody got eaten by a shark. But when the police investigated, they found that the limbs were actually severed with a blade. And that's what prompted their investigation. Uh, they kind of put two and two together like, OK, this family's missing. We have these limbs. That's when the delivery guy becomes like the main key witness here because he was the last aside from Huang who actually murdered them, the delivery guy was the last person to see them 
alive and well. Essentially what happens, like Susie said, the dude's running the restaurant like normal. In one of the videos that I saw, they claim that he actually rented out their home. Yeah. Which was fucking wild to me. Can I add something real quick? So this Sure. The more I hear this story, and this is this is just like my investigatory part of my brain firing, but like think about this. So we have this story, and like like you were saying, Susie, like I, I would I totally agree with you, by the way, when you were saying that like the, the mom and the dad deserved what they got because they were playing with fire and all that stuff. But here here's a here's an intriguing thing to consider. All of the all of the information we have about how things truly played out probably came from Huang. <laughs> you know, he was the only one there left alive after he killed everyone. So therefore, he was the only one to give the account of how things played out there. And then also, he was probably the only one to give an account of the family's, the mom and the dad's demeanor and like how they didn't give him the money that he deserved. And all that, like the way things played out. I'm going to, I'm going to venture a guess and say that 50%, if not more of that is, is fabricated, like completely fabricated. And that leads me to like, when I hear parts of, and the reason I bring it up is because when I hear parts of the story, like he rented out the house, he went there to stay at the house afterwards, like all that stuff. I think that based off of that behavior, he was probably more homicidal than he led on to believe. I think he was probably trying to save a little bit of face and maybe reduce his sentence or whatever whatever he thought he would get out of it by saying like oh i gave them a chance i you know i said just give me 30,000 or give me 70 or 50,000 then 30,000 whatever but he's really the only one who was there at that time and he's also the only one who can give an account of how people died so he knew that he was the only person who could be held responsible for their deaths so he had to admit that he killed them but i think it's fascinating that he had the opportunity to say things like, um, oh, there was a scuffle or, oh, like he tried to kill me first or something like that. No, but like the thing that came out, maybe he did try to do that, but the, the, the police knew better than that to kind of like give the right account. But just the fact that like you were saying, Chris, he, he went back and rented the house afterwards and he, he opened the shop up again and to make things look business as usual. To me, that kind of spells out premeditation. So I wouldn't be surprised if this dude <laughs> already had in his mind, like, if they don't give me what I want, I am going to kill people tonight. Um, oh, that's anyway, very that's interesting. That's just my perspective. Yeah, yeah that's just you my did perspective. not think about that at all when I was uh, looking into the case. Yeah, and what also helped the police was that the family was reported missing by relatives as well. So that kind of helped them lead them to Huang himself, because it's like, okay, these people are missing. Their relatives are saying they're missing. And we got this weird motherfucker running their restaurant. <laughs> we got random people <laughs> living in their home collecting rent. And I'm not I'm sorry, I'm trying I'm not trying to make fun light of it, but it I laugh because of the audacity of these fucking yeah. people. Like if you look at true crime in general, like Dean, we talked about the Kobe cannibal. Like this dude like fucking ate this girl like it was nothing. And yeah. he had the audacity to go and live his life and pretend that never fucking happened. Eventually it caught up to him because of like nightmares and like he ended up regretting what he did. But I just can't help but, you know, you try to get into the psychology of these people. Like, what are they, what the hell is going on in your mind? Like, are you missing that? piece of humanity where you lack empathy or you lack the ability of foresight and when you could calculate okay if i do this this is probably going to be the outcome it's probably not going to end well for me there there has to be something missing up there and you know we've talked about this during other podcasts as well when it comes to like the judeo-christian argument about how like oh there's you know there are demons or inf whatever like influence or like possession like that comes into play during certain cultures and certain times. But it, in this case, it does not apply because, you know, I mean, you could, I guess you could argue like depending on what their religion, they're Buddhist or something, or, or I guess there are some evil deities in, in religions like that. But at the same time, it's kind of like, not, I mean, I know this is a, a true crime documentary, but I had to just bring that up because it kind of ties into your, your psychological 
concept about what these people were thinking of. And when I think, when I think of people who are like this, you're absolutely right. It's like, there must be something missing in their empathy circuit or like something that just doesn't click because I, like I personally, not to sound like a, like a complete wet noodle, but like if I do something shitty out of like anger or like maybe I raise my voice or something, I'll be really, I'll feel like a pile of shit the next day. You know what I mean? Like I just like, it's just, you can't escape that empathy uh, for other people. Even if you, in that moment, like I could see in this moment, if this guy lost his shit, because like we were saying, that's a lot of money. There's a lot on the line for your life and the value of your life and like quality and all that stuff. So I guess, I, I mean, I'm not saying that it's okay what he did, but I can, I can at least somewhat understand like we've all been to, out to the bar and we've probably seen that idiot who's too drunk fly off the handle and start swinging fists at people in that moment. Like, you know, that person really is losing themselves to their anger. But afterwards, like after this guy killed people, it's, it's kind of like, like, how do you live with yourself after that? Like, I can't, I, I can't even imagine. I mean, Sorry, I, go ahead, Susie. My, yeah, um, my theory is there's def- they're definitely wired a little differently. And it's got to be, for me, I think it is nature in that case, like serial killers. Because if you think about it, is can you think about a scenario where you would kill a family of 10? Like, what would drive you to do that? I don't right think, on. hopefully, nothing would drive you guys to kill a family of 10, including six years old, or someone as young yeah. as six years old. So there's no way that we are wired the same way. No. I mean, yeah, it, that's, that's adults, yeah, I'd, I'd fucking fuck some people up. Like, <laughs> if you're trying to hurt my family, yeah. That's where, like, <laughs> I, you know what's funny? I talked with my cousin about this. And we had this conversation because we talked about, like, serial killers and we were just having this philosophical discussion. And the question came up is, like, what would be your driver to kill another human being and we both came to the consensus that if our wives or future children or like anyone in our immediate family was in some sort of mortal danger even though i wouldn't want to i think in that situation either this person goes or they go or i go and i'm gonna choose my family and my life over some random bastard i don't know now here sorry to interrupt but here's an interesting uh perspective that you can also apply to this dude's life or similar people this person this guy huang operated in a normal capacity for most of his life right however he might have been justifying things the same way you just did in the sense that my quality of life and my wife and everything that I hold dear in my life is receptive upon getting this money from these people, or I'm going to, you know, see what I'm saying? Like, it's not, I'm not saying it's justifiable because it's not a life for a life. Like in your case, it's like, I need to take this person's life because they're literally threatening the life of my loved ones. Right. But the person who might be disassociated like Wong, he might be seeing money as equal to because think about like if you if maybe he grew up in the worst shitty scenario that you could possibly imagine like there are people out there who don't have two dimes to rub together and they really truly know what it means to struggle in life so if they had something like money that would separate them from that life again have that be threatened that would probably be equivalent to someone threatening the act their actual lives their actual life itself now, I'm not saying that that's what this guy Huang was thinking. If anything, I think he probably wasn't thinking like he's probably he probably had enough money. He probably had a decent amount of income to live a comfortable life. He was just being an asshole. Um, but but I just wanted to throw that out there that it's it's not always cut and dry in terms of what people might be thinking psychologically to justify things. Because I always go back to the idea that after and th- this is what I'll throw back to you, Chris, and even Susie, you can answer to this, too, if you wanted but like, if you had to kill somebody in defense of your family, in that moment, you would feel like it's justified and you would feel okay doing it. But what about after? And this goes back to the same concept of like going to war, like fighting for your country, you know, killing people in the line of duty or whatever. Like you are going to try to do that because you need to get home to your family. You need to provide for them. And you know that in that moment. So you're acting in uh, an instinctive fashion. But after you take that life and you have a moment to reflect 
like that psychological part of you, like that we're blessed with like reflection and self-awareness. Like that is the part that always blows my mind when someone acts in this fashion, they, they take a life and they, they're like, they're a serial killer or they act like this one guy, take the lives of a, like life of a whole family, including young kids. Like I couldn't imagine carrying that burden of reflection afterwards. So what, how would you, how do you think you would react in a situation like where you had to take someone's life in defense, like, do you think you would be able to justify that continuously through your life? I would use a specific example from what I saw about, I think this guy was part of SEAL Team 6. And he said that when they went to do the operation to, I don't know if it was the operation to kill bin Laden or if it was another operation. It might have been to take out another high ranking member. He says he remembers going into this compound and he just, they like kicked down the door to the room. The guy's laying in bed with his wife. They're sleeping and he just pops like two bullets in him. And as he's sitting there doing the podcast, he's reflecting. He's, and he's about to cry. He's like, Dude, this is with me every day because I always think back to that moment. I killed this man in front of his wife. She has no understanding of what the hell is going on. He's like, I don't know who that guy is. He could have been someone I had drinks with at a bar, had circumstances been different. And then I think back to, I don't know if you guys have read the Iliad, but um, yes, I always have to throw in a little bit of history and classics in there and ancient Greece. That's kind of my thing. But, Nerd. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, so, but if, <laughs> thinking back to the Iliad, when Achilles kills Hector because uh, Hector kills uh, Patroclus, who was like Achilles's like lover or like best friend or whatever. At the end of it, like he weeps for Hector. And he gives the body back to Priam, who sneaks into the encampment of the Greeks to plead for his son's body. And he gives it back and he cries for Hector because he has that remorse, even though he like recognizes he's this like, you know, this machine of a killer. There's still that aspect of humanity to him realizing that. I just killed someone's son. I just killed someone's husband, someone's father to that point. And when you look back at people like Huang and like Jeffrey Dahmer and John Wayne Gacy and all of these crazy people or um, Issei Sagawa. Oh, geez. What are some other crazy cases? You have like the Hello Kitty murders. You have Ted Bundy. The, Ted Bundy. The guys. Oh, that, uh, the Night Stalker. The Night Stalker was a good example. Richard Ramirez. Yeah, they yeah. don't have that self reflection. They don't yeah. think what they did was wrong. They're yeah. just so numb to it. So that that's my take on it. What, what's your take on it, Susie? Yeah, like I said, they're just wired differently. And a lot of times when I kind of listen to stories about these serial killers, they probably had a pretty messed up upbringing. Um, where they pro it probably numbs that part of their brain, which actually would counter what I said earlier that it's nature versus nurture. But I think it kind of play it. They both contributes to it. Um, but yeah, like I, like I just can't think of a scenario where I would be able to kill people, a whole family, and then go sleep at their house right after, right away. And I just think of time, like, like you were saying, Susie, like you can't imagine killing someone and like living with yourself, with yourself afterwards. It's kind of like similar based off of like, not just your environment of how you grew up, but also all the other factors that play into like your DNA and your gender and stuff like that. And, and if you really had to break down and it's not just, you know, male serial killers, there's also like factors like who, what was that one movie where, um, uh, it, it was about that female serial killer. And it was a it was a really big movie. You can cut this Eileen. out, please, because like, yes, her name yes. Eileen. She's Absolutely. like the only most famous female serial killer. But actually, I kind of have. So I think that serial killers, like depending on what happened to them in their childhood or in their history, there's different reasons why they kill. Like let's say, 
let's say there's a male serial killer. He only targets like brunettes because his mom oh, is a brunette yeah. and she used to abuse him. So there's different like reason. So like they all have like the instances where uh, something that triggers them. And for this case, maybe Huang, he grew up probably with very, like very poor. So he had no money growing up. So then when people are slighting him with money, it triggers him to kill. And this is like a scarcity mindset. And, you know, it, I'm not surprised because growing up in like the 60s in China, many people are poor growing up. And so you made the jab that I was going to make on behalf of Willie, because anytime I talk to him about China, he always says F a certain political party. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wanted to say it, but I, I was like, OK, I don't want to get cyber attacked or something. Yeah. <laughs> And plus, like, if anybody, if a, any group is going to kill for money, it's Chinese people, because we, like... <laughs> cut, that out, cut that out, cut that out. <laughs> I can say that. I'm Chinese. <laughs> but, you know, like, money We did is... not endorse her message. Because <laughs> <laughs> Chinese people, you know, like, money is a very, is very ingrained in our culture. I'm sure you guys have seen that Ronnie Chan, Chan like, said, like, that he's a calm stand-up comedian he oh, made like yeah, yeah. a segment where like it like everything about the chinese culture is all about money like it's actually chinese new year today so you give money to each other oh yeah yeah you're the dragon so, yeah um actually and then i have a previous coworker. she's from taiwan and she told me that like you know so there's like a stereotype that women from Asia, they tend to be gold diggers. And then, you know, maybe more westernized females, they kind of look down on that. They, they look down on the idea of being gold diggers. However, this coworker who's from Taiwan, she kind of gave me a different perspective. She said that growing up, she was very poor, like people in Taiwan are very poor. And the only way to survive is to attach yourself with people to people with money. And that's where, why, like, women from Asia, they tend to be more, like, gold, quote-unquote, gold digger, because that is how they survive. That is their mindset. But us women, like, American women in the West, we are very fortunate. We have we don't have to go through those hardships. So Say that louder. Yeah. Say that louder again. <laughs> yeah. Say we, that louder. Yeah, like, as Americans, like, we grew up, we are pretty, we have a pretty abundant lifestyle. So, that's why we kind of look down on people, quote unquote, gold diggers, because we don't have to go through those same struggles. So that was just like something she told me that changed my whole perspective. And I am back to serial killers. And that is probably. No, I, wait, I, I'm, I, like, I like this line. I have to say one thing off of that, too, because I think it's fascinating. So anytime my wife and I like watch a documentary about nature or like, like we just, sometimes we just like to watch those nerdy documentaries where it talks about like, um, like primate primate groups or, or like the, the circle of life or whatever, like David Attenborough kind of documentaries. And every time without fail, if there's like a scene where the, the child animals being threatened by a predator, my wife is like, Oh, like you, you motherfucker. Like, don't do that shit. like she gets really upset about it. And uh, I think it's like the same idea, but there was also another documentary portion where they were talking about primates. And like you were kind of saying, Susie, like sometimes groups within like a primate sect or something will like the females or even not even just the females, the males as well will attach themselves to the alpha group of the entire uh, collective. And they do that because like, that's the only way to survive, like to get enough food to get enough food for your young to like to uh, procreate like all that stuff like in that sphere it's necessary but it's it's also kind of interesting that some groups of animals that are different from that like they would very much they would they would uh, prioritize the nurture of their children even as a collective like the males would take part in that you know they would be very protective they would be very inclusive of everything but there are other sects of different animals that you know, if you fall behind, you're done. <laughs> you know, you can get the fuck out of my group. And that's kind of scary, isn't it? Like there are some groups of people who are like that. And there are some groups of people who are not. And like Americans, maybe like you said, are tend to be more protective and inclusive. 
Whereas yeah. maybe some, like groups in China, like you know, they, they might experience something more similar or indicative of being left behind if they don't try to keep up in a certain capacity. And that's that to me, that's terrifying. Like I also like I was just laying in the bed the other day with my wife and this is going to sound really stupid as shit, but like like, we're, you know. Uh, to Disney, but like we were just thinking about like how fucking lucky are we to live in this time period? I was like, look at that TV we have on our wall. That's you know that's a TV that we can stream, you know, hundreds of hours of awesome entertainment. We can go downstairs to our refrigerator with cold water and cold food that preserves for a long time. We can literally order out like to any restaurant we want with all kinds. Just it's just a, like like how lucky are we to live in this time period in this place? And then it just really puts things into perspective. Whereas you have like situations like this family to, to tie it back to the story, you know, the, the family, um, they weren't struggling. Like you said, they had a really successful business. They worked really hard yet. They felt like it wasn't enough. And I think that's also part of the culture as well. Like you see people around you in Macau, ultra rich money's swirling around. There's people driving fancy cars. They have multiple homes and lofts and all kinds of stuff. So therefore they think they're inadequate. They don't have enough for their family. So they have to do this gambling thing to feel like they're fulfilling more or getting towards or closer towards that fulfillment of life. But it ends up biting them in the ass because that's not the environment. That's not the way to achieve that in the environment that, that they're in. What's crazy with that family is that they actually had a path forward. They had a freaking successful restaurant business. Hmm. And if your food is good, like word of mouth spreads, they yeah. have the opportunity to grow even more. Like they went from a yeah. stand in a fucking alley or whatever to mm -hmm. an actual establishment. And it's a shame that like this goes to show like how these addictive things just can fucking ruin everything. Can I just but, say real quick that that's really, that, that reminds me of like a situation today where like, let's say you have someone who got really lucky getting a, a lump of money. And instead of applying themselves to finding ways to invest that money smartly or investing in themselves or getting a certificate or something or opening a business, they'll sit there and play with zero days to expiration options on the stock market or something like throwing all of their money in to try to get rich quick. And it's like you had two options, just like this family, like you had two options. You can either go to the gambling table and you can try to get rich quick, or you can take that chunk of money you had for gambling and the time that it took to gamble and open up another location and hire a manager for that other location or, you know what I mean? Like there's, it's different ways to look at it. So it kind of with Susie on this where like they didn't deserve to die the way they did, but they were definitely not in the vein of life that they could have been, they could have maximized their potential. It's also hard to escape the gambling scene when you're in Macau and. Have you been there? No, I'm not. No. Uh, but it just, you know, it just sounds like I'm sure it's like living in the strip of Vegas. Yeah. You can imagine. <laughs> you don't have to yes. All I right, imagine. Dean, we're we're going to Macau, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Put we're gonna put everything on seven black. Maybe you guys Dude, I lost I lost five thousand dollars once at um I think it was uh a, like a bunch of slot machines in um Florida. I was just like like I oh never God. gambled it I never gambled in my entire life. I'm like, I'm going to go to this casino because I've never done this before. I just want to have fun and try it. And here's the chunk of money I had. I thought for sure I was going to walk away with like at least some left over, but I had like a budget of a $5,000 $5, and I lost all of it. So Dude, my budget would be $5. Like, <laughs> like bro, like, you can no. play for, you can have half a game. <laughs> Dude, some of those, some of those slot machines, like you can put in a $500 bill. And if you lose, like you lose that five hundred dollars, like this. some I like in the back room and some like gambling shops, the the minimum bet for just one round is five thousand dollars per. I bet. like how you know all of this. Ten thousand dollars, and I've been <laughs> to a casino twice. Is there I went twice. I'm just really perceptive. That's all. I've only been twice. Don't like give slot me shit. Machine <laughs> is like the worst. Like the worst it chances. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Blackjack's so my game. Uh, yes is Black fun. Jack's that's game. fun that's fun dude i lost 20 dollars on a sports bet parlay that would have landed me 200k if it actually the last like 20 dollars yeah 20 dollars holy shit yeah i pick like a 
10 leg parlay and like it just <laughs> it missed by one. Oh, <laughs> and i got so fucking mad i was like i'm never doing this shit again never doing this shit again well i don't know man if i was you if i got that close <laughs> you got some kind of system a little bit dude i'm half indian i don't like losing money like that it kills me inside i don't think anybody likes losing money <laughs> <laughs> apparently mr five thousand dollars on slots over here <laughs> i kind of liked it it was you know it was, fun. it was fun. Yeah. Well, actually, my husband said one summer he went to Vegas and he lost $25,000. Oh, my God. That, oh, was, yeah. that was way before he met me, though. And I'm like, we could have been living so much better right now. <laughs> <laughs> but no. But, could have invested uh, we, that. <laughs> we kind of went down like a psychological rabbit hole, a philosophical rabbit hole. Now let's tie it back to this case of yes the murders. Right. So they found the body parts due to relatives saying like, hey, they're missing. We don't know where they are. They kind of put two and two together that this restaurant is running. This family owns the restaurant. But there's this random dude that we don't know that's running the restaurant. So eventually he got arrested. First, he police grew suspicious because they searched his bank holdings and they found like documents that belong to the family and he attempted to flee to mainland China but then he was captured on September 28th of 1986 and they convicted him of 10 counts of murder on October 2nd so that's a pretty quick turnaround so it was like what four days Oh, so no, like, that was one year. Actually, I think we forgot an important detail, too. On the day that he killed people, there was actually... Because 10 people normally operate the restaurant. There was nine that day. So uh, Zhang's sister, she was not at the restaurant. Oh. But then after he killed the nine people, he knows that she she exists. She's a loose end. So he actually told her to come to the restaurant, and then he killed her. Which oh, I'm geez. like, oh my God, she is like, she's totally innocent. She had no, nothing to do with it. Had, like, I know it's, that's like the, also the tragic part on top of the children. Yeah. So they catch him. And yes. I think in a span of like maybe a week or so, they convict him of 10 counts of murder. And the fact that he kept running the restaurant, we get, the urban legend that he baked the victims into pork buns. And that's where we get the name of the pork bun murders. I thought that was an interesting it. aspect of the story because like I, like you, like both of you, I um, didn't really have a lot of depth of knowledge in this before learning about it, but I just hearing the title, I just assumed like my mom asked me this morning, she's like, Oh, what's your podcast going to be on today? And then I kind of like told her, a brief synopsis of what I understood about the situation. And of course I was completely wrong because in my mind, I thought this guy like immediately turned the family into pork buns and like immediately started feeding them to people. And I'm like, that's the darkest shit you could possibly imagine. It's still dark, but like you just said, Chris, we're not, there's no, it's all urban legend. Like, you know, I guess he could have, you know, maybe he probably didn't, <laughs> but I guess he could have been like, oh, I saved a little bit of meat. Let me just be super snarky and put some meat in this bun and serve it to it's somebody. Cost effective. But, <laughs> yeah, cost effective. But at the same time, it's like he probably didn't do that. Like that would take way that would take too much effort and too much risk of making people sick from eating human flesh, which I imagine is a thing. But at is the same that? time, is it? I don't know. I guess it depends yeah. on how you cook it. I mean, I I heard that you it's sound a lot like you like have old. some experience. You have some experience, Susie. <laughs> no, I just like I've heard that it's human meat is a lot like pork, and so mixing it with heard pork that. bun, yeah, wouldn't be. I've so- heard that too. Yeah. Uh, so Chris, Chris actually gave me shit because um, we we talked about the Kobe killer, and I went to Kobe at one point and tried wagyu, and I said the same thing. I'm like, oh, I imagine I think that uh, humans, uh, I've heard humans taste a lot like pork. And then Chris is like, you got something to tell us, Dean? Um, like, no. If I ever, if I ever found out I ate human flesh, I, I'm getting nauseous just thinking about. It. I'd probably throw up everywhere. So what's your takes on this? Do you, do you th- what's the likelihood? Do you think that he actually turned 
people into pork buns. I think it it could have. I'm not. I wouldn't be surprised if he did because it probably would have been easier for him to clean, <laughs> dispose. True. I mean, dispose. Like True. probably they he he you know did the disposing on the on the middle of the night and then he cut off the limbs and only the limbs were found on the beach. So mm. like the bodies. So he probably like oh he doesn't know what to do with the rest and just throw it into the grinder. And I know I'm kind of talking about it very nonchalantly, but <laughs> it is very disturbing. And I, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he did it. I can see that now too. Like, yeah, if he had the torsos left over or other body parts that he just did not have the strength or knowledge to get rid of them, why not just throw them in the grinder? So I, I, I don't know. It, it depends on the depth of madness that he reached at that point. Cause I imagine killing 10 people is going to fuck with anybody's psyche. So maybe he really did snap at that point. It's just like, you know what? Let me just get rid of these bodies this way. And uh, I'll make a, I'll make some money back off of them. And I was telling y'all earlier that I've always wanted to try pork buns. I've never had oh. one. And now I don't think I want to. <laughs> They're good, though. Do it, I'm man. I'm sure. I'm sure. And then I was saying earlier, there's like many, I think there's a very famous Chinese movie about like a woman who ate dumplings filled with fetuses to stay young. And I'm pretty sure that was inspired by this case. So there's definitely a, like a fascination of cannibalism there. Chris, we talked about this too, like briefly, we could just, we can just kind of talk about this for a second before we break off too much off on a tangent, but this whole idea that there's some cabal or some like group of individuals out there who consume the flesh of young or the blood of young to stay youthful. And it's kind of like, where did we get that idea from? It's just like, it's just kind of like the flawed human psyche. It's like, oh, young people, young people's body plus death plus me equals me being young. Like, I don't, okay, what? <laughs> That's some specious reason, like, reasoning right there. Isn't it like a real thing when they do like a heart transplant, like an older person gets a transplant and they get a heart of like a younger person, they kind of get like a little more invigorated or something. But not for long though, not for right. long. I think the rest of the body still, you would have to kill a lot of, or you'd have to consume a lot of fetuses <laughs> to stay continuously young it's always like in the movies like oh under the next blue the next blood moon i need to shed the uh the life of two virgins and then i'll be good for another 30 years and it's like no like you'd probably have to do that shit every other week to stay as youthful it's it's a conspiracy theory until it's true <laughs> <laughs> right yeah, yeah, yeah right yeah. right i like that i like your answer better because if i think too much about my answer then i go crazy but I love conspiracy theories too. Oh, yeah. that's great. We haven't really tackled many of them on the show. We should do we, that. Yeah. We'll, yeah, we, we should, should bring Susie back day. and do some conspiracy theories. If we haven't traumatized her yet. If we haven't no, ruined her. Not all at all. <laughs> <laughs> but to wrap up the story that we're covering today. So he does get sent to prison. While he's in prison, the day after he gets convicted, another prisoner beats the crap out of him. He gets sent to the hospital. He attempted to escape from the hospital. On October 6th, he ended up confessing in full detail about how he killed the family. He attempted to kill himself twice. Oh, shit. First one, unsuccessful. The second time, he was successful by cutting his wrist with the top of, like, a can, whatever. And his suicide note, which I found to be really fucking weird that he committed suicide, not to escape his crimes, but to escape chronic asthma. <laughs> what? Yeah. He, the fuck? Like, what the fuck? He like, okay, I'm going to. Yeah, I, I'm having trouble breathing. I don't want to use an inhaler anymore, so I'm just going to cut my wrists <laughs> here and uh, call it a day. Yeah, sure. Likely story, buddy. He but, wants it to be known that he doesn't regret his crimes. That, yeah, that's, probably. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. I think you're right on. He's like, I do not give a fuck, and I don't want to be here anymore. After he died, they were able to take what was left of his fingerprints and link him to the murder in Hong Kong. 
So uh, two things came out of that. Uh, the remains of the family, they were recovered and they were cremated and they were scattered. The ashes were scattered off the coast of Macau by their relatives. So after the arrest, the restaurant was closed and seized by police. In 1987, it was sold to different owners and it's been sold a few times. But as of today, the former restaurant and the apartments above it are a part of the Baxian Hotel. It's B A X I A N. So I don't that's know if I said pronounced, that correctly. Yeah. Baxian. Baxian. Yeah. Yeah. And the, that's that's eight and mortal. That means that. <laughs> really? Oh, sneaky that what, is that what that <laughs> means? Yeah. Trying to capitalize on the murders. On the whole t- oh my god. Oh wow! Like they didn't even bother to change the name. That is so weird. Because it's all about money. <laughs> I guess it's I was, like a tourist attraction now. Yeah, yeah, dude. Which like that. Oh my god! Sorry, man. I I just gotta, like like that's. God damn it! Like that's the shitty world. Like our world is beautiful, but it's also shitty. <laughs> it's like we have people who will turn that into a, a sideshow, but you know at the same time. It, you can have beautiful moments where like, you know, you do reflection on stuff and I don't know. So I'm, I'm just being an idiot digressing. <laughs> no, not at all. That's all good, buddy. But Susie, I did want to ask you, like given they named that hotel, the eight immortals from the cultures, like the Chinese cultural perspective, are there any superstitions the same that we have in the Western world and in Christianity that, there are people that could be possessed by spirits or something to commit these murders. And is there a concept of you don't name a location after something heinous that was committed? I don't know if that made sense of what I'm Um, trying to ask. Well, Chinese people, well, Asians are very superstitious. So there has got to be some superstitions around that. Um, But like, Eight is obviously a lucky number in Chinese. Okay. And yeah, and then immortal is like the gods. Like, so even the name of the restaurant is like all about like well, fortune and uh, gods. So I don't know if that answered your question, but there's definitely a lot of superstitions around like, uh, you know, like death and killing and bad luck. Yeah. So the fact that they kept the name is very like bizarre to me because because we're very afraid of like bad luck and these and bad superstitions and bad omen and so i guess it's all just for the to for the tourist attraction this is purely just me being curious but like what do you have any like spiritual or religious beliefs Susie? like were you raised a certain way or are you kind of agnostic or do you have any like traditional perspectives on things Yes, yeah, so my parents, we practice Buddhism, but we are not hardcore religious. We kind of just practice it on special holidays, like today, Chinese New Year. But um, but my parents wouldn't, we never like went to temples or anything mm. like that. Yeah. Do you believe so, in like uh, spiritual side, like ghosts and stuff like that? You know, I want to believe it. Like I yeah. actually want to believe there's a life or there's something that happens after we're dead. I don't want to believe that we're just gone. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there seems to be a lot of, you know, stories, supernatural stories, paranormal that um would suggest that there is. And yeah, so I want to believe it and I do believe that there is uh, like another spiritual world out there, life after death. Yeah. I have Same to here. ask. Did I have to ask, do, do you know of any stories your family shared with you or something you've experienced yourself that would make you want to believe? Yes. So when I was about 12 or 13 years old, my grandmother passed away. So we were at her funeral and it was an open casket and we were all uh, taking turns going up to pay our final respects. And then as I was approaching her casket, I started to smell something very like, like very distinct and a smell that I've never smelled before. It was like very metallic-y. And yeah, so it just kind of, it just kind of lingered a little bit, but it went away. 
And then two days after the funeral, I woke up in my room in the morning and I smelled that same exact smell, like that mm. same metallic yeah. smell. Like I said, I've never smelled it before. Yeah. So I'm like, what are the chances I smell it again? Yeah. And then it, it kind of makes sense that like, you know, two days later, maybe my grandmother is kind of like making her final rounds like to her family. And, you know, it makes sense that it's two days later because I'm, her, I'm like one of her younger granddaughters. <laughs> so it took time. That's awesome. That's yeah. So beautiful. So, I know. So ever since that, I do believe that there's got to be like, a, like when a person passes, they make one final, final round to, to their family. And I've never smelled it again. Otherwise, I'm pretty sure I would remember it would trigger that, like that sense. That's awesome. I love stories like that. That's kind of like stories where you hear um, people who lost a loved one who had like a favorite bird or something. And like the bird like comes and lands on their windowsill the next day or something like that. Like it's just, yeah. cause Chris and I like are, are us, us idiots like deal with like the worst dark shit. You could probably imagine when it comes to stuff like that, we talk about like demonology, but I, I personally, I, even though it's like not as interesting to people who listen to, to these stories, I think I personally like the stories like yours better where it's, you know, like a family who's like a loved one coming back to visit. Um, that's way better to me. Yeah. Mine are like, what the fuck? <laughs> Getting your aunt shoved back into a bathroom door. Yeah. Room. Yeah. I've seen some shit. I've heard some <laughs> shit. It, it's, it's not pleasant, which I'll ask another question and, it's okay. Like you don't have to make up an answer. If you don't have an answer, you don't have an answer. Or we'll cut it out. Yeah. Yeah. Or we'll cut it out. Were there any topics of discussion with religion and spirits and stuff that were kind of taboo? So for me, it was like, you don't talk about the devil. You don't talk about Satan. You don't talk about demons in the house because there's the belief that if you talk about it, it gives it power and then you welcome it in based on your like upbringing was that ever a thing i would just say that my mom is she was always very superstitious she always liked to wear red because she thinks it's good luck she'll never wear black and she just doesn't like to talk about death uh so even if there's like death on the tv like there's a funeral on the tv she would fast forward it she she doesn't want that kind of energy in the household and that's as far as a, like taboo goes there's nothing I, but i find that all like kind of reasonable like she doesn't want to look at death and that's just how i grew up Susie, we want to thank you for being our guest today for your first podcast oh you God. wouldn't be able to tell that this was your first go around on a podcast oh you were awesome so we hope that you do start up your own podcast and if you ever have guests on, we would love to be on. Look at me inviting ourselves on there. Yeah. <laughs> My non-existent podcast. Your non-existent podcast. Yes. <laughs> you came up with a pretty good name before for it. So I hope um, you actually keep that. It was, okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I would love to. And oh my God, it's so much fun. And I'm so glad that there's other people I can talk like true cry with, because like I said, I can't talk about that with my husband. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't like this stuff. Yeah. yeah so right. I always felt like a psych I I'm like, am I crazy? Why do I like this stuff? <laughs> no, You're not crazy. Fair. No, I, I, I think that like, it's just, there's so many reasons why you can find it interesting. And the next time we do this true crime stuff, Bring your husband on. We'll make we'll make him a believer of it. We'll get a we'll get a four parter going, and uh, he can sit there awkwardly, and then yeah, we can just talk. <laughs> because I like scary stuff. Like I used to watch. I I used to love scary movies, and but because he can't, he doesn't watch it. Like I kind of stopped watching it, and now I'm scared. What? I feel no, like you, you need to watch it. When you need a asleep. tolerance. You need to build a tolerance to these things, and then once you stop watching it, you get scared. You start to get no, scared I, again. When my wife goes to sleep, I, I'll like put on scary stuff or when she's not home. We have, um, is it HBO Max or what the hell they call themselves now? Max. And they have like a, a section dedicated to like paranormal, ghosts, true crime. And that's what I'll put on all day. Like if she's not home, I'll just, just, I have to watch that crap. I have to beg my wife to watch horror movies now. Like, okay. please, like, listen. <laughs> So I guess like this is our outlet. This is our outlet yeah, for like exactly our, our love for scary 
things. <laughs> We're the outliers of society. <laughs> <laughs> We're the degenerates of the the media world. Like everybody likes to watch happy movies and like funny shit. We just want to watch scary, mysterious stuff. Oh, but we're, the go- definitely- we're the goth kids. <laughs> we're the goth kids. So goth there's decoration. definitely a market for it because, like, the Mr. Mr. Ball and there, he has like nine million subscribers. So there's definitely oh, like wow. a lot of people who love this stuff. Yeah, you're gonna hit the Mr. Ball and levels. I yeah. wish. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're all we're all gonna make it, and then we're gonna have this one big ass studio and yes, have, this like, will be the full time job. Yeah, absolutely, but. <laughs> Susie, why don't you uh, tell the listeners of where they could find you? Yeah, so you, I'm on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, uh, but I, I just very I post very casually. So, so it's all Susie Ideally, S-U-S-I-E-I-D-E-A-L-L-Y. You'll find like mom, baby, cutesy content. <laughs> nice. So you heard that, folks. Go ahead and subscribe to her stuff. Her Thank content you. is awesome. And when she comes out with her podcast, give her a follow as well. Yes. And with that, always remember, rag on the hag and check your pork buns before you eat them. (laughs) All right. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for tuning into today's episode of The Wandering Road. If you enjoyed today's episode, please give us a rating on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please share the show with your friends, as that would help us grow immensely. Also be sure to follow us on social media. You can find us on TikTok at TWR Podcast, our Instagram at TW Road Podcast, and our Facebook by searching for The Wandering Road Podcast. If you'd like to get a hold of us, you can reach us at our email address, Podcast at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. We would love to have you on the show as a guest so you can share your stories or you could submit email submissions of your stories that we could dedicate an episode to. Thanks, and we'll catch you on the next one.